many centuries before Christ, on a little rocky peninsula in the eastern Mediterranean, that which we call Western civilization began. Here, personal freedom of thought and expression gave birth to the democratic system of government and a full flowering of the arts at a time when the rest of mankind labored under the burden of absolute political and religious tyranny. The poet Pindar summed up the Greek belief in the ultimate triumph of the human spirit when he wrote, we can reach to God's own likeness in the soaring mind. In the beginning came chaos, and next, wide-bosomed earth and the deathless gods. The deathless gods who hold the snowy peaks of Mount Olympus. The house of Zeus, the loud thunderer, is glad, and the peaks of Olympus resound. the home of the immortals. forth then, O clouds, reveal yourselves. Whether you be resting on the sacred summits of Olympus crowned with snow, or whether you linger in gardens of ocean your father, come hither, come hither, we pray. Eternal clouds, let us appear. Let us arise from the roaring depths of ocean, our Father. Let us fly towards the lofty mountains and spread our damp wings over their forest-laden summits, whence we will dominate the distant valleys, the harvest fed by the sacred earth, and the resounding waves of the sea which the unwearying sun lights with glittering beams. Let us shake off the rainy fogs which hide our immortal beauty and sweep the earth from afar with our gaze. Come then. Let us begin with the muses who gladden the spirit of their father, Zeus, in Olympus with their songs, telling of things that are and that shall be and that were aforetime. Let the muses begin to sing and dance on soft feet up on the highest mountain. Thence they arise and go abroad, praising Zeus. Father of gods and men, how much he is the most excellent among the gods and supreme in power. Though the deep will of Zeus be hard to track, yet doth it flame and glance 
A beacon in the dark, mid clouds of chance that wrap mankind. guardian Zeus that sittest above the clouds and rulest over wintry Dodona. From afar off behold the glory of Olympia. and of the Olympian Games. Where is striving of swift feet and of strong bodies brave to labor. All shout to their horses. and shake the reins in their hands. The whole course is filled with the noise of rattling chariots. The dust flies upward, and all in a confused throng ply their goads unsparingly, each striving to pass the wheels and snorting steeds of his rivals. He that overcometh hath for the sake of these games a sweet tranquility throughout his life forevermore. The far peaks sleep, the great ravines, the foothills and the streams, asleep are trees and hived bees, the mountain beasts and all the dark earth teems and every bird, its wide wings folded, sleeps. The sun in his blazing chariot rides now, lighting the earth. His flames in the high air drive back the stars. And the peaks of Parnassus, where no man walks, flash back from their snows the gleam of his wheels and light man's day. And you, O Lord Apollo, God of the silver bow, shooting now afar. Many are your temples and wooded groves. of lofty mountains are dear to you. There you blossom as does a mountain top with woodland flowers. I sing how at the first you went about the earth seeking a place of oracle for men, O oh, far-shooting Apollo. You went speeding swiftly to the mountain ridge and came to Delphi beneath snowy Parnassus. A cliff hangs over it, and a hollow, rugged glade runs under. There the Lord Apollo 
resolved to make his lovely temple, and thus he said, In this place I am minded to build a glorious temple, to be an oracle for men. And here they will always bring perfect sacrifices, both they who dwell in rich Peloponnesus and the men of Europe, and from all the wave-washed isles coming to question me. And the countless tribes of men built the whole temple of wrought stones to be sung of forever. Muse, tell me the deeds of golden Aphrodite, who stirs up sweet passion in the gods and subdues the tribes of mortal men. What's life or pleasure, wanting Aphrodite, when I am cold to the golden-haired goddess, when love and love's soft gifts no more delight me? Then would I die. Happy that man on whom Mother Earth fully bestows her blessings. His land gives life and is heavy with produce, and his house is filled with many good things. His sons exult in ever fresh delight. His daughters play merrily over the soft flowers of the field. of Hermes, the luck-bringing messenger of the immortals. Sing then of Poseidon, the great god who shakes the earth and tossing waters. The god of the deep. pour forth the rains. Let us move toward Attica, the rich country of Athena, the home of the brave.
Oh, once more to stand, where on the wooded headland, under the shadow of Sunium's height, the surf is breaking. Thence could I greet from afar the divine city of Athens. Stranger, in this land thou hast come to Earth's fairest home. Look out on the olive-laden hills, enchanted hills where the gray gleaming olive, the gift of the maiden Athena, first was grown. A soft gray wreath for a well-loved city, a city of light. Let us visit the dear land of Athena. What glorious temples, what statues, what holy prayers to the gods of Olympus. At every season, nothing but sacred festivals. Then spring brings round again the joyous feasts of Dionysus the harmonious contests of the choruses, the serious melodies of the flute. Sing now of Pallas Athena, the glorious goddess. Our city by the immortal gods' intent and the decree of Zeus shall never come to harm. For our bold champion, Pallas of Athens, shields and protects us. So with a forecast of good, I speak this prayer for them, that the sun's bright magnificence shall break out wave on wave of all the happiness life can give across their land. The histories tell of a mighty power which came forth out of the sea, where on an island there was a wonderful empire. Minos, king of Crete, is the earliest of all those known to us by tradition who acquired a navy. He made himself master of a very great part of what is now called the Hellenic Sea. At the very beginning, these people built a palace which they continue to ornament in successive generations. Every king surpassing the one who went before him to the utmost of his power, until they made the building a marvel to behold for size and beauty. Because of the greatness of the empire, Many things were brought to them from foreign countries, and they had an amount of wealth as was never before possessed by kings.
The entire area was densely crowded with habitations, and merchants kept coming from all parts, who kept up a multitudinous sound of human voices and din and clatter of all sorts, day and night. For many generations they lived as men of high spirit, uniting gentleness with wisdom. But when human nature got the upper hand, they grew full of avarice and unrighteous power. This vast power endeavored to subdue the land of Greece, which finally defeated and triumph over the invaders.
Parts of the circuit wall of Mycenae are still left, including the gate, which is surmounted by lions. Among the ruins of Mycenae are underground buildings of King Atreus and his children. Mycenae, the city once so rich in gold, I who received into my walls the house of Atreus, I who sacked Troy that a god built, I who was the secure seat of the Greek demigods, lie here, the pasture of sheep and oxen, with naught of my greatness left but the name. The mountains of the Athenians are Parnas. where wild bears and boars are hunted. And Pentelicum. Where there are marble quarries.
and high metis. which has excellent food for bees. Attica, because of its thin soil, has been less disturbed than other states since the earliest times. With the same people always occupying it. used to wear arms because they lived in places which were unprotected and unsafe. The Athenians were among the very first to lay aside their arms and adopt a more relaxed and luxurious way of life. I have eaten most austerely little cakes of sesame, honey sweet and drunk down merrily, one large jar in revelry. Now's the time for music clearly, bring the dainty lute along. Now the lovely, the most dearly loved of damsels is my song. Increase in power and wealth brought all the land into the hands of a few. Civil discord became violent until at last Solon became mediator and archon. He fought for both parties against both parties. And he said, I gave the commons their sufficient meed of strength, nor let them lack, nor yet exceed. Those who were mighty and magnificent, I bade them have their due and be content. My strong shield guarded both sides equally and gave to neither unjust victory. On one of his tours in the country, they say Pisistratus, the dictator, saw a man digging the soil on Mount Hymettus. Evidently, all he had to dig or cultivate was stones. And Pisistratus asked the man how much he was getting out of the land. Just so many aches and pains, the man said. And of these aches and pains, Pisistratus ought to take his 10%. The man said this without knowing whom he was speaking to. But Pisistratus was pleased with his hard work and with his plain speaking and excused him from paying any more taxes. Pisistratus kept the country always in a state of peace and good order, so that it became a popular saying that life under Pisistratus was paradise on earth. Athens, which had been great before, now grew even greater.
Meanwhile, Darius, the king of Persia, was going about his own business, assembling a great multitude of ships and a great army, with Athens as their goal. They landed at Marathon. When the Athenians heard of it, they marched out to meet them. The Athenians who marched out to Marathon were led by Miltiades and nine other generals. When the other generals could not agree whether to attack or retreat, Miltiades went to the commander-in-chief and pressed him, saying, It is now in your power whether to enslave Athens or to make her free. Since there has been an Athens, its people have never been in danger so great. If we bow in submission to the Persians, our people will be handed over to the tyrants. But if our city lives through this time, she may become the greatest of cities. All depends on you. The Athenians armed and formed for the attack. They charged the Persians at a run. fought a long time at Marathon, and in the end, the Greeks were victorious. On the plain is the grave mound of the Athenians. I will fight as long as I live and shall not count life more precious than freedom. Greece is narrowest in front of Thermopylae and behind it. It is the width of a wagon road. To the west rises a high mountain, inaccessible and precipitous. To the east of the road there is naught but marshes and the sea. King Xerxes lay in camp to the north, and the Greeks in the pass of Thermopylae. The Persians bore down upon the Greeks and charged them. Many fell, but others attacked in turn, and though they suffered grievous defeat, yet they were not driven off. Persians attacking by companies and in every other fashion could yet gain no inch of the approach. Xerxes attacked again. The Greeks, without hope now of surviving, fought even harder than they had before. It was in this fight that Leonidas fell after surpassing gallantry, and with him other renowned Spartans. The impetuous king of the hordes of Asia, whose race is sprung from gold.
Thus did the Greeks at Thermopylae contend. All these were buried where they fell, and there is an inscription over them. Go tell the Spartans, thou that passeth by, that here, obedient to their words, we lie. When the Greeks in the ships that came down from near Thermopylae had put in at Salamis, the rest of their fleet also heard of it and gathered in. When radiant day, drawn by her white horses, shone over the land, from the Greeks ran out a cheer like a song of triumph. On ye sons of Hellas, free your native land, free your children, your wives, the temples of your father's gods, and the tombs of your ancestors. Now you battle for your all. The Persian ships put out to Salamis and arranged their battle line. The whole number of the ships of Greece amounted to but 300. And Xerxes, this I know, had a thousand under his command. Ship dashed against ship. At first, indeed, the stream of the Persian armament held its own. But when the mass of Persian ships had been crowded into the narrows and none could render another aid, each crashed its bronze face beak against each of its own line and shivered their whole banks of oars. The Greek warships, seizing their chance, hemmed them in and battered them on every side. Be well assured of this. There never perished in a single day so great a multitude of men. Some power divine swayed down the scale of fortune with unequal weight and thus destroyed the host. It seems the gods preserved the city of Athens. The Athenian people, when the barbarians had departed from their territory, straightway began to fetch back their wives and children and the remnant of their household goods from where they had placed them for safety. You can leave your spears behind you Yea, for sword and spear shall cease, for things all around are teeming with the mellow gifts of peace. What a pleasure, what a pleasure, from the helmet to be free, and from the army ration. Cheese and onions and bless me. Think of all the thousand pleasures, comrades wish to be sweet. Oh, all of life of ease and comfort, which she gave us long ago. Figs and olives, wine and myrtle, luscious fruits preserved and dried. Flirting with a little slave girl when the wife is out of sight. Scenes for which our hearts are yearning, joys that we have missed so long. Comrades, here is peace returning, greet her back with dance and song. Fairest of all preludes is the great name of Athens and the mighty race that gave birth to Pericles. 
What city among all lands shall I name more glorious? And Pericles got all Athens and all affairs that pertain to the Athenians into his own hands. Their tribute, their armies, their galleys, their islands, and wide extended power. He turned Athens' aspirations toward sea power. The constitution became even more democratic. That which gave the most pleasure and ornament to the city of Athens, and the greatest admiration and even astonishment to all strangers, was Pericles' construction of the public and sacred buildings, which his enemies maligned and slandered. They cried out in the assemblies, We are gilding and glorifying our city and Athens is decking herself like a vain woman with precious stones and statues and thousand talent temples.
to painters in encaustic for painting the cymation of the epistyle. 30 drachmas. Two leaves of gold were bought for gilding the two eyes of the column. Two drachmas. Two talents of lead were bought for the fastening of the stonework. Ten drachmas. For stonework, for channeling the columns. Ten drachmas. The works grew, all surpassing in their magnitude, inimitable in their beauty and grace. Those structures, any one of which alone should have required, one might suppose, the work of many successive generations, were all finished in the prime of one man's administration. And so we have even greater reason to wonder that the structures reared by Pericles should have been built in so short a time and yet have been built for the ages. For though each of them, when completed, was already ancient in its beauty, yet now, though they are old, they are still fresh and new as in their pristine glory. Time has left no stain upon them. A kind of newness sheds its bloom around them, preserving them untarnished by the ages, as if they were possessed of a spirit that can never fade and a soul that never grows old. In eloquence, no man could equal him. When Pericles arose and took the floor, by ten good feet, our common orators, as by an expert runner, were outstripped. Not only voluble, but with persuasion sitting upon his lips. He bound a spell and had this power alone of orators to prick men's hearts and leave behind the sting. I will speak first of our ancestors, for it is right and seemly that on an occasion like this, a tribute should be paid to their memory. There has never been a time when they did not inhabit this land, which by their valor they have handed down from generation to generation, and we have received from them a free state. What if they were worthy of praise? Still more were our fathers, who added to their inheritance, and after many a struggle, transmitted to us, their sons, this great empire. We ourselves, 
assembled here today, who are still most of us in the vigor of life, have carried the work of improvement further and have richly endowed our city with all things so that she is sufficient for herself, both in peace and war. Of the military exploits by which our various possessions were acquired, or of the energy with which we or our fathers drove back the tide of war, Hellenic or barbarian, I will not speak, for the tale would be long and is familiar. Our form of government does not enter into rivalry with the institutions of others. We do not copy our neighbors, but are an example to them. It is true that we are a democracy, for the administration is in the hands of the many and not of the few. But while the law secures equal justice to all alike in their private disputes, the claim of excellence is also recognized. And when a citizen is in any way distinguished, he is preferred to the public service, not as a matter of privilege, but as the reward of merit. Neither is poverty a bar, but a man may benefit his country, whatever be the obscurity of his position. There is no exclusiveness in our public life, and we are not suspicious of one another, nor angry with our neighbor if he does what he likes. We do not put on sour looks at him, which, though harmless, are not pleasant. We are prevented from doing wrong by respect for the authorities and for the laws, having an especial regard for those unwritten laws which bring upon the transgressor of them the probation of the general sentiment. We have not forgotten to provide for our weary spirits many relaxations from toil. We have regular games and sacrifices throughout the year. Our homes are beautiful and elegant, and the delight which we daily feel in all these things helps to banish melancholy. Because of the greatness of our city, the fruits of the whole earth flow in upon us 
so that we enjoy the goods of other countries as freely as of our own. Our military training is in many respects superior to that of our adversaries. We rely not upon management or trickery, but upon our own hearts and hands. If we prefer to meet danger with a light heart, but without laborious training, and with a courage which is gained by habit and not enforced by law, are we not greatly the gainers? We do not anticipate the pain. Although, when the hour comes, we can be as brave as those who never allow themselves to rest. Our city is equally admirable in peace and in war. We are lovers of the beautiful, yet simple in our tastes. And we cultivate the mind without loss of manliness. Wealth we employ, not for talk and ostentation, but when there is a real use for it. An Athenian citizen does not neglect the state because he takes care of his own household. And even those of us who are engaged in business have a very fair idea of politics. regard a man who takes no interest in public affairs, not as harmless, but as a useless character. And if few of us are originators, we are all sound judges of a policy. The great impediment to action is, in our opinion, not discussion, but want of that knowledge which is gained by discussion, preparatory to action. For well, we have a peculiar power of thinking before we act, and of acting too. Whereas other men are courageous from ignorance, but hesitate upon reflection. To sum up, I say that Athens is the school of Hellas, and that the individual Athenian seems to have the power of adapting himself to the most varied forms of action with the utmost versatility and grace. This is no passing an idle word, but truth and fact. And the assertion is verified by the position to which these qualities have raised the state. For in the hour of trial, Athens alone among her contemporaries is superior to the report of her. No enemy who comes against her is indignant at the reverses he sustains at the hands of such a city. No subject complains that his masters are unworthy of him. Let us draw strength from the busy spectacle of our great city's life, as we have it before us day by day, falling in love with her as we see her, and remembering that all this greatness she owes to men with the warrior's courage the wise man's understanding of duty, and the good man's self-discipline in its performance. And we shall assuredly not be without witnesses. There are mighty monuments of our power which will make us the wonder of this and of succeeding ages. We shall not need the praises of Homer or of any other poet. For the whole earth is the sepulchre of famous men. And their story is graven not only on stone over their native earth, but lives on far away without visible symbol, 
woven into the stuff of other men's lives.